It's my turn. I'm sorry, Kendall and I were in a deep theological conversation back there. Okay, who knows that tune we just sang? I got candy for the women. Who knows it? Bill, what was it? This is our country. This is our country. Good, you win the candy. Oh, wow. I bet I know who's going to end up with it. Well, you just told us to be there. Oh, I know. I bet I know who'll end up with it. Did everybody have a good afternoon? Good, good, good. Everybody got a nap and a nice walk in the park. I'm glad you're here tonight. This is a, a pretty nice Sunday night crowd. Uh, we were all down this morning. Of course, we're missing all the whales and, and just several families. I play a game as I'm driving home on Sunday. Who was it there? And I came up with 21 of our normal people, well, normal's a relative term, 21 of our uh, regular people who were not here. They've been here. We've been hanging out the doors. So one of these days, everybody's going to be here at the same time. I can't wait, can y'all? <laughs> Remember, next Sunday, come on about 8.15, we're going to have a delicious meal provided by the church. And we'll just hang around and have a good time around the tables. Brother Elvin will teach our adult Sunday school class. We'll all meet there in the fellowship hall. Then we will have a special God and country service. You see my sermon title, A Declaration of Dependence. You know, independence is not always a good thing. Sometimes we need to declare our dependence, not our independence. So you plan on being here for that. Card ministry will meet Tuesday, 1.30 and 7 as well. Uh, please sign up for the uh, adult extravaganza. Tickets are going fast. I don't want to be left holding the bag, so we're going to let you sign up first, and then we will buy the tickets. You see the information about that. Also, again, the senior adult celebrators. Now, I really need you to sign up because I am going to be left holding the bag if you don't sign up. Uh, we, uh, we kind of stepped out on faith, but we can return the money, don't worry. But I do hope that you will uh, sign up. It's going to be a great time. Remember Liz Rankin? She's going to be having <coughs> surgery tomorrow and uh, promises to sing on July 25th. <laughs> She's given me her word. She'll be back by then. And then Jessica Goforth is having her baby Thursday at uh, St. Francis on Park in Memphis. Got to be there at 530, and the baby will come when? About, Probably about 7. Se oh, 7 that morning. Great, great, great. It'll take longer than you go in and cut it. Oh, well, uh, that's uh, <laughs> yeah. a little more information that I have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she'll be home by, what, about 4 that afternoon? Uh, somebody told Jonathan, you better sleep while you can. You hadn't slept in 10 years. I, mean, that's what I have, just have. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, you're my guy, folks. Just, you know, uh, you know, a tap on the shoulder. Hey, one of the kids is crying. Get up. <laughs> well, congratulations in advance. we got another precious baby in snow. I can't wait to see the baby. Any other prayer concerns or answered prayer? Anybody got a testimony they'd like to share? Okay, well, I'm proud of Donna. Thought she did a good job this morning, and she's going to do a good job tonight as well. You come on.
stand for the service? The Wells all got plenty of practice this morning. They stood for about an hour in the service. Y'all ought to be ready to go. Why don't we just go ahead and stand for the next hour or so? Uh, all right, take your Bible. Turn, if you will, to Exodus 20. We're looking at the Ten Commandments together. They are Ten Commandments. They're not Ten Suggestions. They're not Ten Encouragements. They're not Ten Words of Advice. They are absolute commandments that are relative and relevant for us today. Jesus never said, disregard the Old Testament law. Jesus came and said, the Old Testament law can be wrapped up in, in one word, personal holiness. And you find holiness in a relationship with me. But the Ten Commandments are relevant. I'm on a, a, a Facebook page with some other pastors, and a guy had the audacity to ask the other day, I suppose you guys never preach from the Old Testament, do you? <laughs> and we all responded in mass. Yes, we preach from the Old Testament. It's relevant and applicable. I, I tell you something that I really don't like to hear. You probably heard it. I, I was raised hearing it. The God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath. The God of the New Testament is a God of love. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The love of God is found from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-17. Even references to God's judgment and punishment are really expressions of God's love. He loves us enough to put barriers around us to let us know exactly what He expects. The Ten Commandments are barriers. They are ways to evaluate our behavior and our obedience. So we are number three tonight, but it is verse seven. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, so many times your name is just banging around and we're not necessarily thinking of it in evil terms, but we don't attack, attach any worship to it. It's not really sacred. It's just a part of our vocabulary, and, and that's okay if we're uh, attempting to witness. But Lord, if we're just using it thoughtlessly, that is a violation of the third commandment. And I pray that we would watch our tongues. I pray that we would understand and be reminded of what James uh, chapter 3 says, that the tongue is a dangerous fire and it can do so much good or so much damage. I pray that we would commit our tongues to you. Lord, our tongues are two ounces, but they can do more damage than an atomic bomb. So let us use it for good and not evil. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you remember naming your first child? You had all of these names picked out. You and your spouse kind of argued back and forth about the name. And, and, and you know, that can last right up to the birth of the child. Donna and I discussed it on our way to the hospital when she was in labor. What are we going to name this child? Jordan, we had some girls' names picked out for you. We didn't have any boys' names because we knew it was going to be a girl. But we just thought and prayed and prayed. And we thought, well, let's come up with a name that nobody uses, nobody's heard of. Let's name him Jordan. Now, you know what happened? Every other child born in America today is named Jordan, male and female. But you probably looked at babies' names. I don't know if you uh, ever looked up the meaning uh, of uh, your child's name or your own name. Greg is a name that means vigilant, always aware, looking around. I don't know that I live up to it all the time, but that's what the word Greg means. Some people give names very, very little thought. You've heard all of these funny stories uh, there was a girl I graduated with named Dietary Perry. 
dietary dairy. Uh, her mother was about to fill out the birth certificate. There was a, a dietician in the room bringing her a tray of food. The mother thought, you know, I like that name. So my daughter's name is going to be Dietary Perry. <laughs> and she's lived with that the rest of her lives. I'm sure you wonder what were Condoleezza Rice's parents thinking when they gave her that name. My brother had a co-worker named Chocolatina. One of my nieces had a student named You a Princess. Princess with a U and an A at the beginning of it. So you look at names and you think, well, those parents did not give it any thought at all. The poet asked the question, what's in a name? And an old country singer by the name of Johnny Cash cashed in on that question. He wrote a song and it just skyrocketed to the top, a boy named Sue, can you imagine naming your child Sue? But he had a lot of fun and made a lot of money with that. Names are extremely important because they are a means of self-revelation. -re uh, you introduce yourself to somebody and shake their hand. You know, the first thing you do is exchange names. Sometimes you may remember the name. Other times... You may forget it two seconds after you walk away. But that's just a way of you revealing yourself to other people. Maybe you wear uh, your name on a lanyard at work. We wore our names on lanyards at the mission trip. And I had people calling me George and Gary and you name it because they couldn't read my handwriting. <laughs> you know, meeting people today it maybe is not as significant as it was 500 years ago. 500 years ago, if you met a person named Miller, you knew what that person did for a living. You met a person named Farmer, you knew what that person did for a living. You met a person named Johnson, you knew what his father's name was. In those days, you would take the father's name, add the word son, Johnson. My mother's maiden name is Jameson, an old Irish expression that means the son of James. So, so years ago, that's how people not only identified themselves, but identified what they did for a living. You know, most of us are called by several different names according to the setting in which we find ourselves. Several months ago, the phone rang up here at the church, Jane answered. A voice on the other end said, I'd like to speak to the head hog at the trough. Jane was offended by that. I want you to know, sir, around here, we call our pastor the Right Reverend Dr. G. Claude Bowers, Ph.D., Esquire. Man said, I did not mean to be offensive. I was just calling with an end of the year donation. To which Jane responded, You know, I think I see the fat pig coming down. <laughs> <laughs> so names are important. You know, I'm called by several names according to the setting. Sometimes I call, I'm called Reverend Bowers. If somebody calls and asks for Reverend Bowers, in all uh, honesty, it's probably somebody I don't want to talk to. My friends know to call me Greg, or Brother Greg. Now, I, I expect the kids to call me Brother Greg. That, that's, just, uh, yeah, that's just fair. But, you know, my friends, they call me Greg. Somebody calls and asks to speak to Greg, I know that's somebody I want to talk to. But if they say, I, I want to speak to Dr. Bowers, or Pastor Bowers, or Right Reverend Bowers, I know that is a salesman, and I generally avoid phone calls like that. You know, sometimes I'm called honey and baby and sweetheart. Sometimes I'm called daddy. Sometimes I'm called uh, things that I can't repeat. <laughs> as much as we value names, they were even more important in the ancient world. Did you know that in the ancient world, a, a person or a thing was not considered alive until it was given a name? You remember one of Adam's assignments in the Garden of Eden was 
uh, giving every animal a name. Makes me wonder, when did he come up with hippopotamus, rhinoceros, <laughs> dragon? When did he come up with those names? But in order for them to be considered fully alive and integrated into society, they had to have a name. And the same thing is true with people. In those days, generally, children were not given names until about their second birthday. And the reason why is there was such a high mortality rate. Uh, as many as 40% of babies died before their second birthday. And the thinking was, well, if we give this baby a name, then this baby will be considered a part of the family. But if we just kind of hold off, if the baby makes it, we'll give it a name. If the baby doesn't make it, then no great loss. That sounds uh, awfully uncaring, but that was the prevailing attitude uh, in that day. Jesus, of course, was given a name on his eighth birthday. Actually, he was given a name a thousand years before he was born. But he had this naming ceremony on his eighth birthday, and the old lady and the old man recognized him as the son of God. When parents agreed to a name, they have a, a baby naming ceremony. There, there's a ceremony now that I just can't adjust to. Uh, I don't like going to them. <laughs> we never had it for our kids, these gender reveal parties. Uh, frankly, I really don't care. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm sorry to say I really don't care, but we get invited to all these gender reveal parties, and I can generally come up with an excuse, but this is the opposite of that. You know the gender. What's the name going to be? And you had a ceremony by which the child was named. Now think about certain biblical names. Anybody remember what the name Isaac means? It's named after Abraham and Sarah's reaction when God said, you're going to give birth to a baby. Laughter. Isaac means laughter. They laughed uproariously when God said, you're going to be the father of a child, a baby boy. Jacob is a name that means deceiver. You know, he's the one who cheated his brother out of his birthright. You know, even when they were born, he was clutching on to Esau's leg, trying to pull him back inside so he could be first. Now, later on, his name was changed to Israel, which means God rules. In the Old Testament, we have the story of a prophet by the name of Hosea. Hosea was a world-renowned preacher. Everybody knew him. But all of a sudden, under the instruction of God, he married a prostitute by the name of Gomer. Imagine how newsworthy that must have been. That would have been like Billy Graham marrying Madonna. I mean, can you imagine the outrage at something like that? But he married this prostitute, and it was a picture of the fact that God's people were lusting after these other gods and chasing after them. Hold off five Sunday nights, and we'll talk about that further. But they have two sons, both of whose names are significant. They have a son named Lo-Ruhamah. Lo-Ruhamah means no more compassion. A prophecy that God's mercy was at its end. Then they have a son by the name of lo am I which means not belonging to me, not my people. And both of those names were very significant. In uh, Genesis 32, Jacob argues with this mysterious figure all night long. It was an angel. It was God. It was the Holy Spirit. We're really not sure. But it was a, a heavenly visitor, a heavenly presence. And Jacob asked all night long, what is your name? Because again, your name is a means of, of self-identification. In uh, Exodus chapters 3 and 4, God appears to Moses at the burning bush. And, and Moses just asked the question, if they asked me who sent me, uh, what shall I say? What is your name? 
And God responds with that kind of confusing statement, I am who I am. And really the best way to translate that is, I will be what I will be. In other words, I'm going to continue to prove myself to be the miracle-working, loving, gracious, merciful God I have always been. So we come to the third commandment. Thou shalt not, have, uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The name of God is found in, uh, frequently in Scripture. God's personality is bound up in His name. Psalm 8, 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 34, 3, come magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Psalm 18, 18, 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they're safe. The safest spot on the face of the earth is close to fellowship with God. His name is significant. And that's why it doesn't need to be banded around with no uh, uh, emotional attachment given to, given to it whatsoever. Actually, God has many names, especially in the Old Testament. You know, Jesus, the Son of God, has about a hundred names. God the Father has about 50 names in Scripture. In Psalm 23, 1, the Lord our shepherd, that is Jehovah Rohi, the God who leads us and protects us. In Genesis 22, we've got Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Judges 6, 24, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. And peace means a sense of wholeness. Uh, Exodus 17, 15, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. When we march into battle, we are not marching under the American flag or uh, the Tennessee flag or the Confederate flag. We are marching under the banner, the standard of Almighty God. Jeremiah 23, Jehovah Sidnaku, the Lord our righteousness. We are made righteous by a relationship with Him and not by anything we can do. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. So the third commandment says, do not misuse the name of God. When my parents helped me pack my bags for college, I remember my dad coming in and saying, son, uh, we're not wealthy, and we've not been able to give you everything that we wanted to or that you wanted. I, I didn't realize it at the time. I thought we were rich. But my dad said, I, the greatest gift I gave you was the gift of a good name. And I pray that you would not go off to college and misuse the name that's been given to you. And I tell you, that's one thing that has kept me on the up and up over the years. Now, I've fallen. You know, I'm sure that I've caused shame to my parents, but, but I have been given the gift of a good name. Bible says a, a good name is greater than gold. So many of you have good names in Haywood County. People respect you. They respect your name. You've been adopted into the family of God. You've been given a, a new name. You've taken on the name of Jesus Christ, and you are commanded not to misuse it. Now, how can we misuse the name of God? I think three ways. Number one, we can misuse the name of God in our words. Profanity is a means of misusing the name of God. There was a series that we really wanted to watch on Amazon Prime, and, and people bragged about it. The scenery was beautiful. The plot line was beautiful. And I tell you what, we couldn't get very far into it because of the language. The F word, every other phrase. And I tell you what, I just don't want to pipe that into my living room. And another reason I don't want to pipe it in, that's not my living room, that's yours. Uh, Built with your tithes and offerings. And I just don't want to pipe it into a place that has been entrusted to me as your pastor. I cannot stand profanity. I was around a fellow not long ago, and 
He kept taking the name Jesus in vain. Oh, Jesus this, Jesus that, Jesus this. And finally, after about 15 minutes of it, I, I said, you know, he sure does. Guy looked at me like I had a third. He said, what do you mean he sure does? I said, well, you've been saying uh, God saves. And just want you to know that he does. He saved me and he can save you. And he ripped that foul tongue out of you. I didn't say that. But I, I did say, you know, God saved. You've been testifying to that. Anytime you say the word Jesus, you're testifying to the fact that God saves. Anytime you say the word God, the word God means he is. And is, there's a Hebrew word that means he was, he is, he will be. Uh, he's all around. Everything about him is encapsulated in that one phrase. So do not take it in vain. Now let me step up on a soapbox. And Donna's heard this for 40 years. I really don't like to hear gosh and golly and darn and shoot. You know, it's just a polite, uh, you know, different interpretation and pronunciation of a, a cuss word. I know, you know, we all do it. I understand that. But let's find another word to use. I, I like the word rats. And, you know, something makes you mad. Don't say shoot. Say rats. Don't say darn. Say golly gee willikers. You know, find something to say that is not pushing the envelope about taking the name of the Lord in vain. Uh, another thing I don't like is these slain expressions for God. Oh, the man upstairs. Uh, you know, he's not just upstairs. He is all around us, below us, around us, uh, above us, in front of us, and back of us. He's not just the man upstairs. Uh, I just don't like to hear that expression because it cheapens God. I mean, it places God in a certain location. You cannot put God in a single location. He is too uh, immense for that. Did you know that in the Old Testament, people would not even say God's name? Anytime you see the word Lord, in the Old Testament, that is a Hebrew, Hebrew word, Yahweh. God is the Hebrew word Elohim. Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh. Uh, Y-H-W-H. Hebrew doesn't have any vowels. You kind of have to plug the vowels in and, and hope you're right. Yahweh, people didn't even say it. They would write it, but they would not say it because it was so sacred to them. And they did not dare speak the word of God without a worshipful attitude behind it. So we can misuse God's name in our, our words. Number two, we can misuse God's name in our worship. I'm kind of picking up on what we said this morning. When we worship, when we lift up our voices in song without any meaning to it, uh, you know, how does that sound to God? Listen to some of the hymns we sing. I love to tell the story. <laughs> Do we really? Do we really? Do you love to tell the story at work? Do you love to tell the story out in your neighborhood? Do you just love to go to a family reunion and call people and say, let me tell you the story of Jesus. Let me tell you the story of how you can inherit eternal life? Or are we saying, uh, God will take care of you? And then we worry about everything. We're kind of negating that song. That was written by a pastor's wife who was dying of cancer. He was so concerned about her, didn't even want to leave her to go and preach. But she always said, hey, God will take care of me, and he did. And he healed her. Not physically, but spiritually. Gave her a brand new body. But when you see God will take care of you or me and you worry all the time, that kind of negates that song, doesn't it? What about to owe for a thousand tongues to sing? I know a lot of people, they don't even use the one tongue they have. They don't use a thousand, even if they had a thousand, I wonder if they use it. Uh, you know, it's just kind of disingenuous to sing songs like that. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. 
when is the last time I have spent an hour in prayer? Way, way, way too long. Way too long. Maybe we need to change it to sweet 10 minutes of prayer. You know, sweet hour of prayer. I, that might be a little disingenuous. Standing on the promises. You know, the promise of God is that he'll take care of you. Promise of God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, promise of God is that Jesus Christ is standing at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Promise of God is that this world is not our home. This life is not our end. There's a great day coming. There's a bright future. Do you stand and plant your life on that? I surrender all. Do you really give every portion of yourself to the Lord? You lay it all on the altar. Heard about a lady one time who uh, went forward in a a revival, and she was known as the biggest gossip in town. And she grabbed the microphone, and she said, oh, I just want to lay my tongue on the altar. And a fellow in the back said, uh, lady, our altar's not that big. <laughs> Do you know, have you laid your tongue on the altar, your wallet on the altar, your future, your calendar, your checkbook on the altar? Victory in Jesus. Why is it that so many of us live defeated lives when victory is a promise to us? Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. 1 John 3, 16. Faith is the victory. Victory is ours. What about uh, we are one in the bond of love? And we've been put together and unified by the blood of Jesus, but when there is broken fellowship, doesn't it kind of... Uh, discredit and disqualify songs like that? When we sing songs without any meaning or when we pray prayers without any meaning? Now, Jesus tells uh, the story of a, a Pharisee and a poor man who go to pray. The Pharisee left there dignified. The poor man left there justified. Pharisee got up there and bragged about everything he had done. Boy, uh, God, I'm sure not like this fellow. This guy's a sinner. This guy's terrible. I'm so grateful that I'm uh, just wonderful and I've never given you any trouble. Like I said, he left dignified. The other fellow left justified. He prayed, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he was saved right then and there. When we sing and pray without any uh, thought to what we're singing or doing, I think that is a way of misusing the name of God. So we can misuse it in our works and in our worship, but thirdly, we can misuse it in our witness. You know that the word Christian means miniature Christ. Acts chapter 11, uh, Christians or followers uh, at Antioch were first given the name Christian. Previously, they were called followers of the way. But they were given the name Christian really as an insult. All those Christians... Miniature Christ is what the word Christian means. That is what we are. We are a miniature Christ. We are a picture of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And when they see us uh, misrepresenting God, when they see us angry and yelling and blowing our fuse and stuff like that, well, what kind of witness is that? <laughs> uh, Butch Westover and I were uh, having coffee the other day, and he was talking about uh, a letter he got from a lady one time. He said, you don't know this, but I saw you and your wife at Branson not long ago. Some lady from Branson. She said, I, I just watched you. I didn't go up and introduce myself. I just watched you. I knew you, but you didn't see me. And she said, I just want you to know, I saw that you and your wife bowed and prayed before you met. I saw that you pulled a track out and gave it to your waitress. And I just want you to know what a blessing that was. I mean, what if he'd gone there and acted ugly? Uh, you know, knowing somebody was watching him. You know, here he was 500 miles from home. In all likelihood, he wouldn't have seen anybody. But I tell you, there's a Murphy's Law. If I were to go to Timbuktu and walk into a casino or a liquor store, half of you would walk by and see me. And that, you know, that's just Murphy's Law. But somebody saw him and was so impressed by that, 
you know, wrote him a note. I mean, it just was an incredible blessing to him. We possess the name of Jesus Christ, and we ought to be living up to it every day. Paul says um, we ought to live up to the high calling that is ours in Jesus Christ. Alexander the Great you know, conquered the entire known world. He had a soldier brought to him one time for desertion. The soldier had caused problem after problem. He couldn't be disciplined. He was just wild and disobedient. He finally ran off and they found him and dragged him back. Alexander the Great asked the fellow, point blank, son, what is your name? Well, my name is Alexander. Alexander the Great uttered these infamous words. You probably heard them. Son, change your ways or change your name. Change your ways or change your name. I wonder if God doesn't want to say that to us sometime. Change how you're living or just stop making that public claim that you're one of my followers. So that's what it means to misuse the name of God. Misuse it in your words, in your worship, and in your witness. And I hope it won't be said of any of us that maybe we have misused it or taking it, taken it in, in, in vain, you know, used it without any worshipful intent at all. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your spirit. Lord, every single one of us is guilty of uh, using your name impolitely or lightly or flippantly or without any worship or intent at all. And I, I pray your forgiveness for that. I pray that each of us would make a fresh commitment to, to lay our tongues on the altar, all joking aside. We need to do that. We need to just commit our two-ounce tongues to you. Uh, just allow you and, and, and implore you to use them for your glory. Lord, we don't have a whole lot of control over what we say, but, but you do. And we just surrender ourselves up to your lordship and your guidance and, and those guidelines that you've laid down that keep us uh, within them, those parameters that you've set up around us. So, Lord, as we leave from here, may we leave with a song in our hearts and a word of testimony on our, on our tongues. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks a lot.